Good morning, Fusion Church. Hope that you're doing well. It was great to see many of you this week when we had our outdoor kind of worship thing here at the office. 
It was awesome directly, like right at 7 p.m. when we got ready to start uh, worshiping together. It started raining, even though the forecast said there was no rain. Uh, it just felt like a perfect kind of thing for this season of life. Like nothing goes exactly as planned. All your plans get uh, disrupted and interrupted. And it just felt like, hey, this is just more of the same. But it was so good just to push through and to be able to, to worship together. We're going to do that again in a couple weeks. And so we want you to join us uh, in that. So before we get ready to worship today, as we're gathering together in our homes, um, I just want us to take a second and get ourselves present in the moment for worship. To, um, you know, we don't have a sacred secular divide where we're doing really spiritual stuff when we sing and, and, and then, and we listen to, and we're watching this or we're reading our Bible and then we're doing not spiritual stuff. It's all spiritual. It's all a relationship with God. Every ounce of what we do is lived before God. It's lived unto God. So, so it's all spiritual. It's all sacred. However, there are just moments in time that we carve out where we say, you know what, I really want to focus my mind and my heart on the Lord here in this moment. And when we gather together like this, whether we're in person or whether we're in our homes, that is what this moment is. It's a moment for us just to say, you know what, uh, I'm really turning down the noise in the world. I'm turning down the noise and all the chaos that might be going on into my life, maybe even all the really good things that could distract us and things that we're celebrating and we're, we're turning down the noise and all, all of that, that even might be really good to focus our mind and our heart on Jesus. And so I just want to give you an opportunity to do that before we launch into worship this morning. Uh, whatever's going on in your mind, uh, I just want you to just take a second. I want you to name it. Acting like it's not there is silly. So maybe you're coming together this morning and you've got gratitude in your heart. Maybe you're thankful for your family's health. Maybe you're thankful for your, the opportunity to worship together this week. Maybe you're feeling grateful for the people that you live with, thankful for your job. Whatever it is, I want you to just take a chance and I want you to name it. Maybe you're coming with anxiety or worry, uh, and, and that's what's just what's on your mind. You're having a hard time transitioning right now into worship. You know, God isn't offended by those things. He actually wants us and welcomes us to come to him with those burdens that we're carrying. So just name that. Just say, God, this is the thing that's on my heart. Maybe you're grieving. Maybe there's been some loss in your life and you're feeling sad. God doesn't ask us to check that stuff at the door. He asks us to bring it all to him. And as we bring it to him, as we name it, as we, as we see the thing that's in our mind, we can actually offer it to Jesus. And then he can begin to shift our perspective so that we can begin to well up with gratitude, so that we can see he's present with us in our pain, so that we can celebrate with him the things that are on our mind rather than just celebrate on our own. He wants all of that. He wants all of you this morning. So I'm just going to pray, and then these guys are just going to play for just a minute or two to give you a second to name those things as we come into the presence of God, to actually shift your mind, your posture, so that you are focused on Jesus. So let me pray for us. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for my friends who are watching wherever they are, all over the world, around the country, here locally. God, I thank you for the ways that you're working and taking care of us. God, and we just know that you care about every need and thought that we have. So I pray, Lord, that, that you would help my friends, uh, whether here in this room or watching at home, to bring their whole self into this moment, to be laid bare before you, and that, God, that you would just meet them exactly where they are, whether it's in celebration or in sadness. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out the presence of Jesus into our hearts. Shed abroad the love of, you, of God into our hearts now so that we can worship in spirit and in truth. Would you come, Holy Spirit, come and bring the presence of Jesus into our homes right now. In your name, amen. So just take a minute, think a little bit, and then these guys are going to lead us in worship.
If you want to gather what you need, we're going to take communion. As you get ready to take communion together, if you need to, pause this, because I want you to hear what I'm about to say. So go ahead and pause it if you need to, so that you can hear. If you had any idea how much God loves you, it would absolutely blow your mind. If you had any clue just how great God's acceptance of you, his delight in you and over you, if you had any clue, it would absolutely blow your mind. It would stop you in your tracks. You have never experienced a love like his before, never. We can't fathom it. It actually takes faith to believe. It takes something supernatural in us to actually believe in God's love for us at the level, even just a little bit of how much he actually loves us. We think that in order for God to love us, in order for God to accept us, we have to impress him to be into his presence, that we have to do great things, that we have to maintain a certain level of holiness. The, the message of the gospel is that he maintained ultimate holiness so that we don't have to worry about that. Not so that we can do whatever we want to, but he knew that we were incapable of achieving that on our own. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus achieved what we couldn't ourselves, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. He walked among us. He left his throne in heaven and all that that entails and walked among us us sinful people. And he knew every detail of your life, every aspect of sin, every sinful thing you would ever do. He knew it ahead of time, yet loved you anyway. We see that when we're, we're stepping into sin, when we have moments where we lash out in anger, where we're short-tempered with our family, where we give in to that temptation again, that, that somehow pushes God away. But the message of the gospel is that at our worst, Jesus comes and sits with us in that and says, I got freedom for you here. I have a way out for you here. I love you. He doesn't love us despite that. He's not going, yeah, I guess I'll tolerate that. He says, no, I love you so much that I will give myself to conquer that sin that's bringing destruction in your life, that's bringing destruction to other people around you. The gospel is that you are saved and redeemed from all of that. You are delivered. You are so deeply and fully loved. I wish that there was some other way to say it. I wish that there were more words that I could say to kind of convey the truth of that. But the truth is that it has to be a spiritual conviction that we have in our heart. There actually, the Apostle Paul says that the Spirit, the Spirit of God is poured into us and helps us to know that we are loved by God. And communion is that symbol it's the, of how much God loves us, that he would send his only son to die for us, that he would shed his blood and let his body be broken. He loves us so much that he gave himself for us, even in our sin. Again, that's not a license to do whatever we want, but it is a full-on invitation to receive the love of God that covers every ounce of your sin. 
every, every mistake you've ever made. He loves you. He just does. So today I want you to take communion and the confidence of God's love in faith of God's love. Believe, actually to not believe that God's love covers your sin, that his sacrifice covers your sin, is actually to do an injustice to Christ's sacrifice on the cross. To believe that that was not enough is an injustice to him. It's like turning when someone says, I love you, and kind of doubting that love. This is the ultimate I love you from Christ our Lord, from God, from the King of the universe to you and to me. So take communion together as a family. Rejoice in God's unquestioned love for you in communion today. Just a whisper You breathe in me a new song You take me back And I'll remember The joy of my first love And praise will be my song how can I contain it? I cannot contain this love. And praise will be my song. How can I contain it? I cannot contain this love. I can feel you all around 
I'll shout out, I will sing of love for me. As you reach out, I can feel you all around. Mm, praise will be my song. How can I contain it? I cannot contain this love and praise will be my song how can i contain it i cannot contain this love oh praise will be my song i cannot contain it how can i contain this love song I cannot contain it how can I contain this love it's my soul and I cannot contain it it's the overflow of my heart Lord, I just pray that our praise that's been lifted up and offered to you would be pleasing to you, that, that you would feel as though you've heard from sincere lovers of you, sincere friends who adore you and worship you, who are delighted with your presence. So Lord, I just thank you for for that opportunity to give you praise. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you, Lord, that you're refreshing some people right now. You're restoring some people right now. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. We just bless your name. We ask for you to be with us over the next couple minutes as I share. Um, and I just pray that it will be something that will be helpful in our journey of following you and being the people that you've called us to be. I ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Why don't you go ahead and pass the peace. Uh, let somebody know you love them, you miss them. Go ahead and send them a text. Uh, the, that's just a, a, a fun little practice. Um, go ahead and send someone a message right now. That would be great. And then we're going to dive in here in just a second. Uh, it was, again, just so good to see so many of you uh, this past Tuesday. We're going to be doing a couple more worship nights again like that in the future. So uh, so we hope to see you again. Uh, we hope that um, that was just refreshing for you to worship with other people. I know it was just good for my soul to hear some other voices in the room and singing. I just want to give a shout out really quick to our folks who have been here week in and week out uh, uh, trying to pull off this uh, this recording for it for everybody and uh, making sure that you have an opportunity to worship your home. So thanks to our worship team. Thanks to Meg. I mean, just it's, it's just been so incredible. I don't know that people realize how difficult it is uh, to be in a room where there's no one in it worshiping to an iPhone. It feels like that that's what's happening. And they've just been so, so faithful. And so I just want to just give a shout out to them to say thank you for the all the hard work uh, that you all have been doing. And uh, and you out there, if, if you haven't already, shoot somebody a text who you see up here on a regular basis. Let them know that you appreciate their labor and maybe um, even maybe people who have been giving kind of the, the welcome, just let them know that how much you appreciate this. So no one ever this is how we would be doing church in 2020. Um, so just let somebody know how much you appreciate them. I know that they would appreciate that as well. So 
Just want to thank you also for those of you who have been giving. Uh, I was talking with somebody this week and they were asking me, hey, how's the church's finances doing? I said, you know what? Better than they've been in over a year. Uh, and so I'm just thankful for the ways that God has been blessing you and taking care of you, being uh, faithful to you. And I'm thankful for your faithfulness in giving. So just uh, can encourage you to keep that up. You can give online. Uh, go to our giving tab on our website. You can give that way. Uh, or you can just send it old through the snail mail. We'll take that to you. So just uh, keep keep that coming. Uh, also, I want to thank you for everybody who has been serving so faithfully in the different arenas we have as a church, especially those uh, serving at Big Table and with our food pantry. It's just a blessing just to see how, how people are serving, uh, getting food, receiving food. It's just it's just awesome. So thank you for, for all that. It is a, a privilege and a joy to pastor this church and to be a part of this church family. So, uh, so thank you guys for all the incredible things that you're doing. I'm going to dive in and I've got a short message for you today. So uh, this is going to not be very flashy. I've got a very straightforward thing that I want to share uh, that's on our heart. That's kind of the end of, the, of what we've been talking about. Uh, in this whole series on sacred seasons. So, so we've been looking at this passage in John chapter 15, and we've been really focusing in on verses one through five. Let me read those really quick. It's just a refresher. Here's what Jesus says. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Yay. That's everyone's favorite part, right? The pruning so that it will be even more fruitful. That's the end game. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. Remember that's the rest thing as I also remain in you. So it's not just something we do. It's also something we get to receive. Jesus stays with us. He sticks with us. He pours himself into us. Why? It says here, because no branch can bear fruit by itself. So it's not possible unless you remain in the vine. It must remain in the vine. So you can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you, re I love this, this is a promise. If you remain in me and I in you, he's going to fulfill his end of the promise. He's going to remain in us. He says, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I just love this promise from Jesus. It is his heart and his intention that we bear fruit. And remember, we've been saying that fruit is not just about something that God does in me. It's, it's about how he brings life through me to other people. It's, it's just like the apple that's plucked from the tree that has seeds that can go into the ground that can create new apples or, or, the, or eaten to provide sustenance and life to other people. Jesus is saying, I want you to bring life to other people. And we've talked about how that happens through, our, through the kingdom works, through things that we do. It happens through the character that he's forming in us and how we are, can function in healthy relationships. I talked about that last, last week in the fruit of the spirit. And today I want to talk about how um, that fruit looks like making kingdom people. It's about multiplication. And the, the reality is that unless you're a person who is fired up about discipleship already, this message is not going to do much to edify your heart. You're not going to you're not going to listen for the next couple of minutes and be like, "Oh man, I'm so incredibly encouraged." However, I don't think that we cannot talk about this because this is the end game for Jesus. For Jesus, the ultimate fruit that he produced was other people that looked like him. He did incredible works for lots of different people. He changed people's lives by praying for them and having them healed. He, he did all these incredible things. He certainly brought life to other people through his character by being around them. But at the end of the day, there were tens of thousands of miracles that Jesus did, but only a handful, 120 people that were around out of those tens of thousands of people who got to witness Jesus' miracles. There were only a handful of people who were around that, would, that actually carried on the message of Jesus, that kept with the movement that Jesus started. For Jesus, the whole thing is the sum of his life was almost wrapped up in those 120 people. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish what he did for us in the cross and the resurrection. Obviously, that was the ultimate thing of what he did for us. But without investing in those people to carry on his legacy, 
we wouldn't know about the cross and the resurrection. We wouldn't know about the gospel. It was his investment in those people. Uh, that is why you and I are here today. We can trace our spiritual heritage our, all the way back to those original followers. And even then, 120, I would shrink it down even more to the 12. Jesus invested himself into 12 people. He put the future of the cosmos in the hands of 12 people. Do you, do you realize that? That our salvation, the salvation of the entire world, rested on him giving away who he was to this group of people so that they could carry on the message and do all the things that he said, the, said for them to do. I, I feel like you might think that I'm overstating the case, but I promise you I'm not. Jesus' parting words to his disciples was that they should go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything he had taught them. So his whole thing wasn't, okay, guys, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to build a giant monument here in Jerusalem around the place where I died. I want you to build a big building, and I want you to build a big, giant organization. Jesus did not tell his disciples to do that. He told them to go and make other followers. The fruit that Jesus ultimately wants to produce is the fruit of other followers of Jesus. Jesus didn't have biological children, unless you're like, you want to read the Da Vinci Code or some of those weird Dan Brown books that claim that he did. As far as we know, that didn't happen. We do know that he had spiritual children. He had people that he treated like sons that he was raising up in the faith. And you and I are here as a result. So he wasn't interested in building a building. He was interested in building a spiritual family of which you and I were a part. And he spent the majority of his time, it's interesting, if you ever want to do a study, look through the Gospels and see how much time Jesus is spending, not with the crowds, not with great crowds of people, but with his, just his few followers as a matter of fact, so many of the parables, when we sit and we read them, we realize that it wasn't for everybody that he was sharing these parables. It was actually just for the few of his disciples. Think about it. Jesus spent three years on earth, and we don't have that much of his teaching contained within the Gospels. He spent a lot of time walking around with his disciples. He spent a lot of time uh, on dirt roads and hills just sharing life with them. Uh, and he believed that that was the thing that was going to change the world. When I think about just like, it's helpful for me to think about this like a family tree. You know, I can trace my actual physical, biological family back to like the 1600s. Uh, someone has done a ton of work in our family to see our family tree. It goes back generations. And there are some really cool stories in that family tree, but I can trace some of the first people who settled here in the United States from Germany and Switzerland and some other uh, Northern European places. I can trace my heritage to, to there. I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm here as a result of them deciding to come across the Atlantic Ocean and settle here. I have a spiritual heritage too. So I can trace uh, my family tree back to people who have invested in me, my, par my parents and their grandparents who were kind of like first generation believers. And then I can chase my, trace my spiritual family tree back to men and women who have invested in me to become the man that I am today. People like Bill Simmons, people like Eric LaRue, people like Paul McConaughey, who uh, have invested time into me to help me be the man that I am today. And I'm so thankful for that. And I think that a way that I want us to think about uh, this whole thing is your spiritual family tree. If you were to look off into the future and think about your life, who would be able to, down the road, be able to trace their spiritual heritage back to your life and your investment in them? Right now, that might seem like a far-fetched idea. And maybe it's a little bit easier to think about with just within your family heritage, but I, be I believe that God has more. He has certainly our family, our kids in mind for those of you have, who have kids, your family members for sure. But he actually has a spiritual heritage beyond that that you can't see. That his, is his heart and his design for you is that you begin your own spiritual family tree so that people can trace back and see, gosh, you know what? I'm following Jesus 
and I know Jesus and I, and I have freedom in my life and I can look back and I can see that person invested in me. I believe that's God's heart and his intention. So briefly, how did Jesus do that? How did he create this spiritual legacy by investing in a few? A couple quick things. First of all, he just shared the good news of the gospel with people. He just shared, this is what the good news of the kingdom is like. This is, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he talked to them about how the good news is that kingdom of heaven was there in him as a person in front of them. And he shared this good news of, of how if they would come and follow him and put their faith in him, believe who he was, that they would be saved. So he just shared the gospel with people. And then what he did is he saw people who responded to that gospel, and then he picked a few of them, and he began to show them how to live in the gospel. He showed them, this is what it looks like to live out the truth of this thing that I've just shared with you. He invited them to come and follow him, and then he invested himself in them. It was actually a really big deal in the first century for a rabbi to pick, handpick their students and ask them to come and follow him. It was a high commitment all the way around. And when Jesus invited the disciples to come and follow him, he was asking them to be a part of his life and that he was going to invest them. He showed them how to live in the kingdom that he was talking about. So he didn't just say, hey, this is the way to be saved. He showed them how it was that they were supposed to live in this kingdom. And then he sent them. So after he shared the gospel, after he showed them how to live it, he sent them out to go and do the same thing. So at the end of the gospels, we see the great commission where Jesus is sending them out to go and make other, other followers. And the rest of the New Testament, we see the same exact thing. The language shifts a little bit. So after the gospels and the beginning of Acts, we don't see the word disciple anymore. Instead, because we go from a primarily Jewish audience to a primary Greek audience, the language shifts to a father-son language or to a mother-daughter language. And the reason for that was, is that in the Greco-Roman world, you would apprentice underneath your father or your mother. You would come alongside of them. So they didn't use the word rabbi. They didn't have the word disciple. They used another kind of metaphor for explaining this relationship. So Paul, the apostle, for example talks about Timothy and he talks about him as his true son in the faith. Peter, the disciple of Jesus, talks about Mark or also known as John Mark as his own son. The apostle Paul talks about Onesimus and the book of Philemon as, as his own son. And what he's meaning there is, look, I have invested all of myself into this person so much so it's as if they are my son. They are my spiritual child. It might seem like a funny way to think about it, but that's what they're saying. It's the same exact concept. I've invested myself in this person. I've, I've recreated what God has done in my life, in the life of another person. So we see that legacy extending all the way through the New Testament. And here's the thing. You and I are called to do the same exact thing. Every follower of Jesus is called to make other followers of Jesus. Every single one of us. The call to make disciples is not something for pastors. It's not something for a special elite group of Christians. Every believer is called to give away what God has put in your life. In your life. So think about this. The call to disciples, the disciples was come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So there was an immediate invitation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in you, but I'm investing in you so that you will go and do that with other people. And that is the same uh, for us as followers of Jesus. The challenge is our message of salvation, that invitation to come and follow Jesus, has been a little different. For many of us, the call to come and be saved was a, was a call to come and escape hell. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to go to hell. I definitely want to go to heaven. And while that's a part of the gospel, it's good news that I get to spend, uh, uh, when I leave this body, I'll get to spend it with Jesus, and then I'll get to spend eternity with him here on a new created earth. That is incredibly good news. For the early Christians... It was understood that when you accepted that invitation, you also accepted the challenge to make other followers of Jesus. 
But for so many of us, that has been separated, the call to salvation and the call to discipleship. And what we need to do is reframe our thinking so that we all see ourselves as followers of Jesus called to make other followers of Jesus. Think about it this way. God has planted a seed in you and giving him has given you himself. So he has made an investment in you. He has put himself in you. And he's done that not only for your benefit, although that is key. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to operate in freedom. He has planted that seed in you so that you would bear the same kind of fruit in other people. And he's used someone else to do that in your life. And so the seed that God's planted in you is for your benefit, but it's also for the people around you. Here's what I know about healthy things. Healthy things receive life and healthy things give life. Healthy things receive life and healthy things give life. So think for a second about a body of water. A body of water, if it doesn't have water flowing into it, fresh water, and it doesn't have an outlet for that water to flow out, it will become stagnant. It actually won't be able to sustain life very well. In order for water to be able to not be stagnant and actually sustain life, it needs something flowing in and it needs something flowing out. And I think a lot of Christians feel stuck in their life because they're so focused on what's flowing in, they're not worried about where it's flowing out. So the life of God is meant to flow into your life, into someone else's life. That is the way that he has designed this thing. And the opposite can be true too. Some people can be so busy pouring out that they forget that God's life is also for them. And that's for a small group of people. The majority of people have forgotten, and I would put myself in this category for much of my life, that the thing that God has entrusted me with, the work that he's done in my life, is so that I can multiply that into the life of other people. Whatever God has done for you and what he's done in you, it has never been just about you. It has always been so that he can give away, so that you can give away what he's done in you. It's interesting, not one time, does, does Jesus ever tell his disciples that they should build the church? But he tells them repeatedly that they should go and make disciples. And we just know that if we will focus on making disciples, if we will focus on giving away the thing that God has stirred up and done in our heart, that, that he will actually build the church that we dream of. So th there's a couple challenges here. First of all, I think one of the challenges is it easy to talk about this in theory. It's a, it's a little bit more challenging to talk about it and, and kind of like getting down to what do I actually mean? And a lot of us want to define discipleship in some narrow ways. And I'm one of those people. I think we should be clear about what we mean by discipleship. That's a, that's a message and a series for another day. But here's what I would say. If we would simply say, what has God done in my life? And how can I give that to another person or a group of people? How can I give away what God has done in my life? We would be plenty on our way towards making disciples. We would be plenty on our way and bearing fruit in the lives of other people by giving away what God has done. So if God has given you victory in areas of your marriage, let's say you've gone through a difficult period of time and you feel like, man, God really helped us. We learned a lot of things. Look, God did that for you, but he also wants to do that through you. He wants you to give away the good things that he's done in your life. If you've gone through really difficult financial times and you have seen God take care of you in those times and you've been able to work through that, man, I promise you that's not just for you. It's also something that God wants to do through you. If you've grown in the area of like emotional health and stability, if you work through anxiety and depression and you feel like, gosh, I feel like I've, I've been on a journey here. I've got something to share. Yes, you do. There are people who need what you have to give away. That's just, that's just disciple, discipleship in the most generic possible terms. And if we all just gave away whatever it is that God had given us, 
man, we would be way down the road. Now we can get more specific about that. We can talk specifically about teaching other people the basics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, because that's absolutely an essential part of discipleship too. But I feel like so many of us are intimidated by trying to figure out, I got to figure out the whole thing that we're sitting on stuff that God has done in our lives that we could be giving away to other people. We're waiting for the perfect scenario to give it away. And God's saying, look, no, there's somebody who needs what you have to invest in them. I would rather us invest in a messy way in people's lives than us not invest at all. And to be really clear, there was never a discipleship manual dropped from heaven that said, this is the exact way you do it. The disciples learned from Jesus. They watched him. They observed him. They did all this incredible, they spent all this time with him. And for sure, they have a leg up on us and understanding how to do it. But I promise you that if you will just make the step saying, I've got some things in my life that God has done. And I, can, I know that I can invest in this other people that we'll work out together as a church how that's actually supposed to look like. We'll work through the mechanics of all of that. Now, this is not in any way to diminish that necessity of teaching people the basics of the faith, of just learning how to be a follower of Jesus. Um, that, that is absolutely so essential. And we need more people doing that. But I feel like that aspect of things intimidates so much people that they don't give away what they have. And, and I don't want us to do that. I want us to do both. Actually, I think the best case scenario, best case scenario, and this is the way it's worked in my life, is I've invited people to say, you know what, hey, I feel like God's taught me some stuff. I'd like to share my life with you too. And along the way, I know there's going to be some things that God's taught me that maybe I can share. I can share with you. Here's what I think the plan would look like. And we're just going to journey together for a year or two on this journey. And, and sometimes it's really clear application of stuff that God's done in my life. Sometimes it's been more focused on sharing God's word and helping to understand God's word. It's looked so different. But the key thing I think is the yes that we have. So there's a couple things here about this. So, so sometimes it's confusing because we associate discipleship or multiplication with something programmatic. It's a program that I sign up for. It's a class that I complete. That's not discipleship. <laughs> discipleship is an intentional pursuit of learning something. It's apprenticing. It's taking an apprentice on, so teaching someone, this is the way. <laughs> and then it's learning from someone else, this is the way. So it's not a programmatic thing. It can include that, but that's not the whole picture. So if you're waiting for a discipleship class, uh, you're, you're going to be missing exactly what God's heart is for you. So it's not exactly a program. Some people think that discipleship or multiplication is primarily about evangelism. Uh, and so discipleship is really about teaching people how to believe in Jesus. And that's a part of it, but that's not the whole thing. And so sometimes that is scary for people, and so they don't invest in people because they think, gosh, I don't know how to, how to do that well. So that's just a part of it. It's not the whole of it. It's also sometimes we think that discipleship is something primarily for new Christians. So it's for people who have said yes to the faith and need to learn some basics of the faith. Look, I've been a Christian my whole life. I don't ever know, uh, I don't ever remember a time when I didn't believe in Jesus, but I'm still learning stuff about how to follow Jesus. So it's not just for new believers, it's for everyone. Sometimes we can think that only mature Christians can do it. This is something only mature Christians can do. And people who really know a lot and have been Christians for a long time. And while it's true that those who are mature in the faith can have more to give away, we should not let the, long, the length of time that we've been a follower of Jesus keep us from investing what God has done in our lives. So, for example, the woman at the well has this encounter with Jesus in John chapter 4. She has this amazing encounter with Jesus. And she immediately goes and tells her village about everything that, that happened in this encounter. That's discipleship almost at its most basic form. Look at what God has done for me. I'm going to share this with you. Now, obviously, if that woman went on to follow Jesus for the rest of her life, she has a lot more wisdom. She's got a lot more things that she can share with people. But sometimes I think we have this, this mentality of like, gosh, I just have to be a perfect Christian. I have to have all the things worked out in order to invest in people. And that's not true. We certainly want and mature people investing in other, in other people. Uh, and we want to be careful about making sure that we keep, keep kind of the uh, people steered and focus in on Jesus. But we don't have to wait until we know it all to do it. 
So a couple questions for you. Have you ever been discipled yourself? A lot of people feel like, gosh, I don't know how to invest in other people and give away what God's done in my life because I don't know that I've ever been imported, poured into in that way. And that can be a real challenge. And, and here's what I would say about that. I, I would say that many of us have not had the mentors we ultimately wish we had. Most of us have felt like if we could look, look, down, look back and say, man, I wish somebody could have taught me that. I wish someone could have taught me that. And here's the thing, with every generation, we learn from our experiences and we can share that with other people. So don't let the fact that someone hasn't done it perfectly with you keep you from giving away what you know God has done in your life. Look, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know God has done a work in your life and you know you've got something to give away, but you're feeling as though because it didn't happen in a specific way and you weren't given the tools and resources from another person, you don't have like a model to follow. Look, the Holy Spirit will be your teacher in this thing. Not only that, as your pastor, if you're saying, hey, I wanna learn how to invest in other people, I will stop whatever it is I'm doing and put all of my energy into that because I feel like that's the thing that Jesus would make a priority in his life. So if you've never been poured into, maybe just a couple questions to think about. First of all, are you hungry for more of God? A lot of times no one has invested in us because the truth is we just weren't hungry. When I look back and I think about my life, the times where there was someone to invest in me, it was the times where I was really hungry and I wanted more. Uh, I wasn't just waiting for something to happen. I actually said, God, I want to learn more. I want to know you. And God has put me together with somebody who has been able to pour into me. So, so if you're saying, gosh, I've never had anybody pour or invest in me in the way you're talking about right now, I just wonder, are you hungry or have you been hungry for more of God? Secondly, are you teachable? Um, there are a lot of people say, yeah, I want to learn. But at the end of the day, there's a, a lack of humility and we're not teachable. And actually, there's been times in my life where I, where I was seeking a mentor and I got shut down and it was really frustrating and really discouraging. When I look back at that season of my life where I was looking for that mentor, I realized I actually wasn't very teachable and had a person tried to invest in me the way I thought that I wanted, I would have resisted it. And so actually I look back and I'm really thankful that I didn't have what I wanted because God had a work to do in my heart to get me to a place where I could be teachable. And I'm still working on that. I still have my own opinions and thoughts. I still have my own stuff going on that, that makes me sometimes want to resist what people have to say. But here's what I would say. We have to have a, a curious spirit about us that's teachable, that says, God, I want to learn more about you and I'll learn from anybody who looks like you. And if we'll have that, I think that, that we open ourselves up to be poured into. And then the last thing I would say is, have you ever asked? I know that there was a period in my life where I was really hoping that someone would invest in me, some hoping that someone would mentor me, but I, I was just kind of waiting for God to drop it out of the sky. <laughs> and I know many people who have felt the same way. But the reality is that when I took the steps of asking, it was vulnerable, and at times, it didn't work out the way I thought it would, but I also was able to find mentors and people to invest in me and pour into me in ways uh, that have really transformed and changed my life. So have you asked someone? Have you, have you looked around? Uh, again, I, guys, I'm not trying to give you like a, 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 um, a, a real kind of descriptive way to go out there. I'm just trying to stir your imagination about what's possible here. So here's what I would say, if, if no one has ever kind of invested in you, if no one's ever discipled you, and you feel like, gosh, I'm just hungry to grow, here's what I ask you to do. Look around our church community. Look for some people who say, you know what, there's something about that person and their relationship with Jesus right now. There's something about the way that person interacts with other people. I want what they have. And I'd encourage you to go and ask that person. Hey, would you mind spending a little extra time with me? I want to learn some things from you. My guess is that the majority of those people would say yes. Some won't. They won't have the capacity. They won't have the time. That's okay. Like I said, I've been turned down from that before. Other people have, and it's really discouraging. But what I have found is that when I kept pressing in, God redirected me 
to a point where I found the right person at the right time. So look around. Don't, don't let the fact that that hasn't happened for you yet keep you from being the kind of person that learns from another person. Also, the best way to start with discipleship is to take advantage of what is already there. So you may be a part of a community group. I would encourage you to be a part of that community group. First of all, the leaders who are leading those groups have spiritual wisdom to give away. And the best way you can be a part of their life and to learn from them is just to show up to that community group on a regular basis. And then if you feel like you need more outside of that, my guess is some of those leaders would give you access in a deeper way to their life. You'll probably even meet people within that group that you can learn more from. So, so wherever you are in, in, in that process, I would say take advantage of what we're already doing. Don't look for something outside of what we're doing if you're not already taking advantage of what we're doing. I know some, so many people who say, gosh, I wish I was growing more. I wish this was, you know, I wish this was happening in my life. I feel kind of stagnant. It's like, well, are you taking advantage of the buffet that's on the table before you? So start there. And if, and if you still feel like you're hungry, you still feel like you're more then go after more. Ask someone to invest in you. Guys, you can come on back up. I'm going to wrap up here in just a second. Now look, again, I told you that this wasn't going to be the most inspirational message. Uh, and I'm okay. I bet there's probably even some of you said, okay, can you end this already? This is not my, this is not my thing. That's okay. Because if only a few of us get it, if only of us, a few of us are hungry for a deeper level of discipleship, if only a few of us say, gosh, I want to be invested in and I want to invest in other people, man, we're way better off than what we were before. Remember, Jesus preached to tens of thousands, but there was only 12 in his inner circle. There was only 120 in the upper room. And so we don't need everybody to buy in. We just need some of us to buy in. But here's what I would say. It is the call of every believer to invest in other believers. And if this was a different setting, a different time period, I would say, okay, here's your next step. I want you to do X, Y, Z. Here's our discipleship thing that we're doing. I'm not going to do that. Here's what I know about discipleship. And here's what I know about most things that if we have a desire to step into something new, a desire to change, we will overcome the how to. We'll press through the thing that we don't know to figure out the figure out what it is. So there have been many things in my life throughout throughout the years that I felt like, gosh, I really wish I knew how to do X, or I wish I could do X. But the reality was until that internal motivation got to a certain point in time, I would let that I don't know how to kind of thought keep me from doing a thing. And until that internal motivation turned up enough inside of me to the place and to the point where I was saying, you know what, I know I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to figure it out. And that has to be an internal kind of motivation in us. We have to have something that's welling up in us that that's kind of that conviction. So, so like, you know, just take like going, losing weight or something like that. You know, if you, if you think about it, it's like, gosh, everyone can say, gosh, I feel like I know there are some things I could do. I could probably do this. I probably do that. And, and you could even like read a manual. You could get all the information, but there has to be an internal motivation that has to click inside of you to say, you know what? I'm pushing past just the trying to figure out the head knowledge. I'm actually going to go to the gym. I'm actually going to buy the healthy food. I'm going to do whatever it takes to see, but it has to come internally. Having all of the right knowledge can't help you with that internal motivation. So here's what I hope has happened. I hope that in a few of us, you've been kind of sparked to think about what is it that I have that I could give away to other people? What is it that God has done in my life where I could share that good news with other people. Maybe some of you are thinking about kind of the good news of the gospel and remembering how you heard that one time and how you need to share that with other people. That is an incredible application to this message if that's what you're hearing. Gosh, I need to share this with other people. Maybe some of you are thinking about, uh, I, I know, I, 
I know that there's more to life than what people are experiencing. And I have, I feel like I can maybe help them on this journey of getting all of that Jesus had to offer out of this life. Maybe some of you are thinking about, gosh, I really know that I know the scriptures. I feel like I could walk people through understanding the Bible a little bit better. And I feel like that. Maybe some of you are thinking about that kind of emotional health or healthy marriages. And you're thinking, gosh, I know, uh, I know that there's some things that God's done in my life. I feel like I could share with other people. If that's the case, let me ask you, what's your next step? What do you plan to do about it. When you're motivated, when you have that internal thing stirring up in you, you'll push past the how do I do it to actually getting to do it. So what is it for you? I want to give you a second to think right now. What do you feel stirred up about right now? Maybe you're saying, I like what you're saying. I like the concept. It's not concrete enough for me yet. I don't know what to do, but I feel stirred up about it. Let's have a conversation. I would love to talk to you about that. Maybe you're saying, gosh, I really feel like I want to do what you're talking about. I want to invest in other people, but I still feel like no one has really invested in me and I just don't know where to start. So do some of the things I talked about. Show up to your community group. Have conversations with people around our community who you feel like they've got something to give away. And if all else fails, then feel free to contact me. Let's let's have a conversation. Uh, If I can't do it myself, I will help you find someone who can invest in you, who can help you figure this thing out. You were not meant to do this on your own. You were not meant to figure it out on your own. Maybe you're like, yeah, I feel stirred up about some stuff, but I'm not sure what the next step is. When Jesus was ready to call his disciples to himself, he spent an entire night in prayer. I can honestly say there have been one or two times in my whole life where I stayed up all night praying. Uh, So I'm not asking you to stay up all night praying. I'm just asking you to pray a little bit about who God might be putting in your path and what he might be asking you to give away. I know that some of you say, you know what? I got to start with my family first. And that is a great place to start. I, I, I want my kids to learn how to follow Jesus. I wasn't taught how to do that for my family. So I want to make sure that my kids get this. And that is an incredible place to start, but it's a starting place, not a finishing place. It's interesting, there is very little mention throughout the New Testament uh, about just families investing in families. It's The reason for that, it's assumed that followers of Jesus made uh, disciples of their children. But, but there's not that same assumption that, about them making disciples outside of their home. So, so let's just assume... <laughs> together that we're going to make disciples of our kids for those of us who have it. But then let's make a decision that we want to make disciples beyond our household, that our our spiritual family tree goes beyond the people who live under my roof into the people who live in our neighborhood, into the people who live into our community. What will be your spiritual legacy? Who will be the people that can trace their family tree to you? So I'm going to give you just a second and be quiet and let these guys play for just a minute. And just let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what he's saying, about what he's saying and stirring up in you right now. So go ahead and just take a second, listen, see if you can capture a thought right now. I want you to just ask God, what is my next step? God, what do you want me to do? Where, where's my next step with this? How do I step into bearing fruit in this area?
maybe that answer is coming to you right away or maybe you need to spend some more time praying. Here's what I know that Jesus promised when he told his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples. He said, and I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. His promise to be with us is a promise that's attached to making disciples. So if you want to experience more of God in your life, give away more of God from your life and to other people. I feel God's presence the most, not just in intimate times of prayer, not just in times of worship, but in times where I'm investing myself in other people. I feel his pleasure, his delight. I feel grow, like I'm growing in wisdom. I feel like I'm growing and understanding who he is when I'm giving away who he is to other people. So I would encourage you to do the same. And if you don't know yet what that next step is, I'd encourage you to pray. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll be done. So Jesus, I just thank you that you set the example and the tone of what it looks like to be your follower. I pray, Jesus, that you would bring a sense of clarity and conviction uh, around us making disciples so that we know who it is that we're supposed to invest in and how it is that we're supposed to invest in them. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that, that you would just bring just a, a, a deep abiding sense of conviction about this to people. Not a, not a sense of guilt for not having done it, but a sense of excitement about the adventure that lie ahead in investing with other people. And I pray, God, for your grace to be on it in the messiness as people ask to be invested in, as people ask to invest in other people. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would just, your grace would be all over it, Lord, that you would care for us and watch over us and all of that. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we at Fusion Church would be a disciple-making church that we would multiply ourselves and that we would have a spiritual legacy that long outlives us, that long reaches beyond uh, what we could think or imagine, that the investment we make in other people will multiply and multiply and multiply so that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in the people's lives as it is in heaven. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I hope you have a great week, Fusion Church. Uh, I hope that um, you feel God's presence. I hope that, that you feel his pleasure. You feel his delight this week in whatever it is that you're doing. I hope that he begins to stir up a vision for discipleship in you this week. And that we'll see you again next week as we launch into a brand new series. God bless you. Take care. 